MIT. No, I just didn't open the first page. Oh, it was the other one. The first page was the right, but it was just. as to what your project you want before that continue to ask questions and um, we can present some more ideas but uh, I prefer that you have invested enough time to come up with the uh, ideas okay next week as you know we have the special um, uh, extended class uh, the fee is thousand uh, dollars that you don't have to pay but for uh, if an outsider takes the class it's you know it is 995. Um, now I talked to Prasad, and uh, his both his class, programming language and algorithm class, are uh, available uh, as video recorded classes because he also teaches online version of those classes. So they are available online. So it is um, you can um, you know skip that class or basically do the lectures, preferably even earlier than. Uh, so this weekend, for example, you can take care of those classes. And so that you can attend the class, this this class, it be easier that way than this one because this class is kind of continuous. So if you miss the class lesson Tuesday um, between two and three thirty, uh, sorry, sorry, before that or after that, it's very hard. It's, it's harder for you to catch up later on, right? This series is just one series of classes. So um, we'll we'll I'll we'll show you what the scale, what the content is for the class but uh, should be hopefully interesting in that way you have a lot of classwork done even more than you know required number of class lectures and then we probably want to mostly move towards um, uh, uh, move, move, move towards project right okay um, now uh,
today um, I'm going to uh, talk about relationships. Okay, and let me give I think you can, you know, you can start the recording. Ready? <coughs> okay, so today we are going to talk about relationships. And earlier in one of the classes I mentioned that relationships um, are at the heart of uh, semantics and semantic web. Uh, this is uh, a version of a uh, talk that I gave in 2008 at this conference that you can see. Uh, there was a, an earlier version of a of, of, on this topic uh, that I talked in 2002. Okay? So some of the slides even come from that. And then the work continues thereafter. Um, I hope you guys uh, looked at at least the, the two main papers that I asked you to look at. Right. Um, Let's start and let's step back and see how the web has evolved. And of course, there are many ways you can, you know, just you can cut a pie in many different ways, right? Um, just like you can have pizza slices mm -hmm. like that and square pizza slices also. But this is one way uh, that um, uh, the way web has evolved. And we talked about some of it before, but this is yet another way. So uh, after the um, web uh, of HTML, we started to have what we call web of databases, where pages were dynamically generated. And you would have query interfaces. So you type something in some form. We didn't have AJAX or things of interface technologies like that. But then it will uh, essentially end up being a query against a database. You get the results back, and then there's a formatting, and the page is rendered. Then what happened, so that, the, at that point, the focus was on data. But uh, then um, uh, focus shifted on, or the new thing that occurred is services. So what we had after the web of documents and web of databases, we got the web of services. And um, one very interesting thing happened. Before these services, what happened was that uh, if you're an application, it will reside on a computer on a server, on a laptop, or desktop, whatever that is, or a mainframe kind of stuff. And you log into that device, you, and you work you know, from a, or a terminal connected to that device, or an you know, interface to that, and you will you know, invoke the application. With the service, what happened was that you got the ability to wrap any application, and access it remotely using the service interfaces. And various technologies evolved, uh, you know, came about. Visual, for example, web services description language was just one of them. Before that, there was something called Corba. Right? And um, you know, it was a heavy duty services uh, distributed computing framework. And you have clients and servers, but uh, they did come up with some way whereby the application component on the server side could be accessible from the client side and the two can communicate with each other. But there's a lot of work to uh, make the Corba infrastructure work. In fact, um, uh, at my previous organization, LSDI's lab, we were among the leaders in use of Corba technologies. And um, uh, we also started to, so, so what happened then is that applications even when developed independently, could be wrapped up and posted and then accessible through a web-based interface. Or it would have something that is programmatically immutable, right? which is very powerful. Now you're not only sharing the data or, or document or database, but you have basically an application that's accessible remotely. Right? Uh, then came web of people. Right? So social networks, user-created documents. 
and variety of other things. For example, gene drift is um, something where um, people in uh, that particular discipline, biological discipline, uh, would annotate gene sequences or gene uh, you know uh, that they found in the data. Right? So what what means what it meant is that you had data accessible on the web, just like you used to have HTML, but now people were annotating it. That means you are doing collective intelligence. Mm -hmm. In the Wikipedia, you would go and edit a document that is available. Now, if you had instead a scientific data set or an engineering data set, the experts in those fields can annotate. Basically, they are labeling the data. That is a form of semantic web in a way. You know, annotation is a core aspect of semantic web, right? If you need annotation with regards to a common standard, common reference, common vocabulary, common ontology, then it will be closer to the semantic web vision, right? Because there is a consistency in how you annotate. If you, um, you know, uh, if it is free uh, for anybody, like uh, annotating images on Flickr, then people can use, you know, unconstrained language to annotate uh, the document, and it's much more likely that two people will uh, annotate the same figure very differently, right? Well, there, is a, there is a picture and uh, one person annotates to describe what is in the picture and another person who is a, uh, an artist could potentially say, oh, this is a picture of so-and-so artist taken in this time frame and such. So it's about the picture, not what the picture shows, right? So there are a lot of options people have, right? So. Uh, Again, if you use ontology, you can focus, uh, you know, require people uh, to focus on the topic of interest, the perspective of interest, and then you have something common. And then I had said that eventually we are moving towards this thing, and I call this vision computing for human experience. So if you go to noises.org slash vision, there is um, a, uh, uh, you know, a vision piece and uh, video and other things that you can read up about and on what I mean by that. And um, in a part of that was that web becomes an oracle. It becomes your assistant. It becomes your partner. Right? And uh, you can ask the web what you want. But you're asking a que question for which you expect an answer. You're not giving a search term for which you get documents from that you have to read to get the answer for yourself. There's a distinction, right? One is uh, like you ask a human the question you have, and the person receiving your question has the knowledge and understands kind of what you're looking for and gives you something that is readily be readily consumable, usable. While in the typical typical web search, you get documents. It's up to you to interpret it, and each of us will interpret it differently. And um, here, uh, using semantics to leverage tax data, services, people, so all different forms of resources that could be accessed on the web became available. Um, There's a very interesting uh, quote from Brady Bush, who is very well known in some circle, you know, in object-oriented design uh, and application. This is a book that, that is very popular one. And he said, object, an object by itself is intensely uninteresting. Came up or one of my students had found this uh, quote, and I'm using it. Now, so in that context, what happened in the way the web has evolved, another way to think about it is that earlier, um, you know, to get data or information or document, you uh, make a search using keyword. Mm -hmm. And even today, that is the predominant way most of us find what, you, what we are looking for on any search engine, right? But the emphasis is subtly moving towards entities, which gives you information. So when you uh, type in name of um, uh, a well-known place with uh, you know, Tali, uh, you had this rich media reference object, right? Mm -hmm. And Google has so-called information object, or something like that. It shows up on the right-hand side. Custom box. Huh? Custom box. Custom box, yeah. It shows up on the side. And uh, uh, earlier, they used to uh, get data from Wikipedia. Yeah. Now, you see that they may be coming from multiple sources. Mm -hmm. right? 
and you saw that at least in the Tali and uh, what kind of semantics about uh, things that 10, 15 years ago that we, we already did that kind of stuff. But then again, the focus is on object or entity, name of a place, organization, person. So we type in a well-known person, a uh, person of the type that might have Wikipedia article. Uh, then it is not just the text, uh, you know, uh, first name, last name. You know, it, it says it's first name, last name of a person, right? Um, and then uh, the focus is uh, moving further. So at this stage of entity, you still have what um, uh, we tried to do a long time ago, but also what Google called uh, things, not strings. So the things, these are things, entities are things. Right? So that is the uh, kind of um, way Google search started to describe, or I mean single started to describe Google semantic search. That it gives you things, not strings. Right? Not st strings is the same as keywords. Right? And the future is uh, that uh, where the relationships are understood. So this presentation that one of the papers that I asked you to read is all about relationships. Right? And it adds a lot more meaning to data. It makes information at a more usable uh, level, brings information at a more usable level. So, um, um, and then uh, entities and relationships are also needed to model and study events. So further down from relationship, you can say, uh, you can also talk about events. Uh, one of, um, uh, you know, person I talk about often, Ramesh Jain, has talked about events quite a bit, an event where. So, um, here again, this is past. We used to focus on a very simplified view, documents and media, and that essentially is about keywords or syntactical representation. Entities, very roughly speaking, uh, you know, kind of gives, brings in a structure. Um, so, you know, not, it's a very approximate thing, but it's kind of, I'm just trying to say that from syntax to structure semantics, uh, documents uh, or data to entities to relationship, mm -hmm. a, 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 an evolution that is just going on. Uh, these are not necessarily totally mapping, but the evolution is in what I'm trying to convey. So there is a continued progress along that line. Okay. So, um, and there is this term that uh, uh, I coined and we had an article called Relationship Web. Relationship Web takes you away from which document could have data or information I need to interconnecting web of information embedded in the resources to give you knowledge, insights, and answers that I need. Okay. Now, when you talk about relationship, the number of issues that come into picture. Um, understanding and modeling the relationships, identifying it, or extracting it from the data that may already exist, expressing it, how do you express it? The language of representing the relationship. Discovering it or exploring relationship, taking multiple pieces of information together and finding the connections between them. Hypothesizing and validating relationship. I'll show you some examples. Utilizing and then building the applications that exploit relationships. Um, there's another um, sort of evolution, you could say, from data to information to in insight to actions. Right? And in doing so, you have to uh, address these issues. What are you talking about? Which thing? Right or uh, uh, you know that that is uh, of interest to you. Who, what, or which person or persons, where, when, how, why? These are some of the things that you talk about to try and understand. Right. And um, there are many faces of relationships, um, and these are some examples. Uh, one is what I call implicit relationship. So statistical representation of interactions between entities, co-occurrence in terms of uh, uh, terms being the same, cluster, tag clouds, right? 
Also, simple thing like linking of one document to another via hyperlink, where the semantics of why the two things are linked are not explicit. Right? Uh, we have seen H href, and there's a concept of mref that I had introduced. Um, the two documents belong to the same category uh, that are simply in a concept hierarchy. So these are just some of the ways where implicit relationship between um, entities can be identified or, or talked about. Then there are explicit uh, linguistic relationship. So here you say, he with Randy Johnson, and that is somehow converted into Willis with Randy Johnson. So you of course have to understand what he represents for, right? And then you can explicate, and then you say this is the relationship in this case. Right? And then there can be uh, even more complex entity in relationship, meaning that relationship may be temporal in nature, maybe spatial in nature, maybe spatial temporal in nature, spatial temporal thematic in nature, a whole variety of things where by which people are, you know, things are related. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, about the implicit relationship, can we use, can we say that? Uh, complex free languages uh, is the language you, keep, you can use to describe such a relationship to a start from the text or is is not appropriate? Yeah. No, uh, I think that has nothing much to do with complexity or not. It is something to do with whether implicit or explicit, whether you can name the relationship or not. Okay. Right? I understand. Like description logic play a role for this kind of the, the formal relationship we we go through the paper you told us to read. While I was aiming that maybe uh, we we have a um, we can have a language to describe such an implicit relationship. You just don't need, you just don't know if that implicitly uh, that that relationship is represented in the in the data I'm, I'm looking for. But I know how it's defined, so I can may try to define it through a query and then ask data to to give me the answer back. That's my connection. But no, the, the, the here the idea here is that the relationship um, can't be exactly named. You can't say, so this is explicit relationship. Okay. Right? But um, suppose you say uh, from um, some sort of data mining algorithm that whenever somebody buys um, bread and butter, yeah, bread and butter, that it is simply statistically observed. Okay. But nobody has say it for sure. Nobody has asked, if you, you do not ask the uh, human explicitly when you, you know, buy bread, do you buy butter, butter? And they don't say that so explicitly. Then the relationship is simply observed in data and you are inferring it. Uh, but it is not uh, so explicitly stated in the data itself. So you always and you, so something. usually what you're trying to do is to capture uh, statistical relationship, core occurrences, clustering, all of those things, which essentially say plausibility, essentially that if this is true, it is very likely, and usually all of these capture something between zero and one, never zero or one. Okay. This is 100%, you know, this, this categorically says, it's ambiguous. and unambiguously says that. Implicit typically doesn't capture, you know, unambiguous. Of course, data can be very uh, unambiguous and then it can, but that's typically not the case when you're using statistical method, right? Right. Yeah, this is very any information material method when you use TFIDF, all those things. So the implicit relationships are, the relationship's existence is easy to tell, but the type of that relationship is the harder part with implicits, right? Uh, primarily so, uh, I mean, there can be ambiguity about both aspects okay. that, uh, you know, you're not certain that that happens, but you have, you have seen probabilistic relationships, you've seen that this is likely or this happens frequently together and that kind of stuff. Okay. Then there are formal relationships, subsumption, right, in description logic. Partonomy, right? And there are multiple uh, definitions of partonomy. There are many, many types of partonomy. One of the person I knew um, did his whole PhD thesis on partonomy. Further down, um, subsumption would typically be true, you know, in its own right. You know, it, it can be formally described in logic. But then there may be domain-specific and domain-independent relationship. 
So uh, the example of domain independent relationship would be like a relationship that is true or exists in time or through the time uh, relationship uh, factor property or space or location. Then we don't mean specific relationship, meaning it is meaningful only in a particular domain. Let's say in um, you know biological or medical or so on and so forth. And they are defined. Uh, they may be common word, but when used in that particular domain, that is a more, more specific or concrete meaning. Right? So then that would be domain specific uh, relationship. <coughs> so um, you know semantics is a study of meaning. We may distinguish a number of legitimate ways to approach semantics, right? But uh, here, for example, you can have a relationship between linguistic expressions, and that would be synonymy, antonymy, hyper, hyperonymy, and so on and so forth. Or you may have a relationship to linguistic expressions um, in the real world, like references. Um, they may also be captured in ontologies using KR languages, right, to support modeling, explicit modeling of relationships. As a uh, link to uh, a good write up um, by Jonathan West. And I mentioned that you know, a little, you know, you can say that uh, go from uh, keywords to entities, uh, things to relationship and events, which is a little bit more compre comprehensive um, object of form where you may have multiple aspects of it. Like in event, you may have something that is happening at a time, at a location as an example. But there, are, there can be even other facets to defining an event. So, but um, some people argue that um, um, humans often um, you know, uh, remember the things, memorize the things, think about things at a more high level of abstraction. So compared to, let's say, a string or compared to an object, right? Um, event is a more complex thing. But um, we would represent, we would, you know, all the, with all the stuff um, happening around us, with all the things that our data that our senses pick up, we massage and then we convert them into um, uh, things of richer representation and richer a more compact form, and those are events. We remember event, birth of my first child, or first time I met my, um, you know, spa, you know, current spouse, or I mean, what you know, all those things that are uh, events. Now you can dissect something like birth of a child to you know a lot of different things. You can unravel the event like birth of a child to be constituting of many many entities and relationships. And you know, or you know, further embedded in time and locations and so forth. But for our human brains, it is argued that it is far easier and better for us to recall things at that high level of abstraction. That something that is more complex but more meaningful to us, right? So, um, birth of a child may have a property saying the um, child of uh, born was born at 7.34, but it's not something that you probably, you know, focus on typically you know, when, you know, the concept kind of, when, when your brain thinks about that birth of a child event, uh, you, you don't really go down to that level typically in this as a need to. Uh, you don't say that the weight is 8 ounces or uh, 16 or 11 ounces. You say, uh, uh, oh, sorry, pounds. But you say that, um, you know, my baby was, um, Better than you know, average weight, things of that nature, right? So, and the things come, and the, yeah, you can things that are abstract, that have emotions, that have you know, warm and fuzzy feeling, can be unraveled into something very concrete, right? Um, so they may have so many different things, uh, you know, in the context of event. Any one of these things may be there if you want to. Uh, uh, represent an event with, you know, in computational form, then you have to ask this question, what linguistic, you can use some linguistic relationship, you can use some referential links, you can use some structural links, you can use some causal links, you can use uh, some relational links. See, all these types of links, and there is a big and vast literature, I can't go into all this thing today, but I do want you to appreciate this variety of different things that, that are there, right? 
different ways we connect uh, to things, to terms, and to objects. So we have so many different mechanisms to do so. Right? That captures the richness of um, uh, how uh, we can, um, you know, our cognition, our understanding. And if you kind of try to uh, pay attention, if you, if you think, what does it take for computers to do that? It's very hard. It's very, very hard to come up with automatic way of identifying linguistic relationship. How does our brain suddenly pick the right linguistic relationship and uh, puts that in the words, right? So we, we do, uh, uh, the point though I'm making is that um, um, starting from rather simplistic thing of syntax and keywords, we are undeniably uh, undeniably moving towards the richer representation, richer, you know, and, uh, you know, and as we do that, the gap between the machine and the man, or human rather, is shrinking. This is also fundamental thing so far, you know, also about all in the big sphere of AI, artificial intelligence. Again, much of what you are trying to do is you do it artificially or naturally, but you are trying to raise this intelligence. What does intelligence mean in that sense? In much of the context, intelligence means better understanding. <laughs> and, and we have three, this three, so if you are interested particularly uh, some of you who are research minded, if you're interested, ask me uh, for a uh, paper on semantic, cognitive, and perceptual computing. Semantic computing, cognitive computing, and perceptual computing. Mm -hmm. right? So they are very interesting things, and there's a lot of work going on today in this so-called cognitive computing. It's a big, you know, inter in, in a very exciting field. This is how Watson, IBM Watson sells itself, right? Cognitive computing. So, um, in, in supporting uh, since objects uh, and events represents or model real world, we can have more complex relationship, you know, like relation between living organism. So you can see like this uh, <coughs> separatropism, antagonism, exploitation, predation. Think about all these things, right? Fairly complex, relatively complex thing, right? It's not as simple as either. It's also a relationship of type, right? But look at the variety of relationship, going from rather s simplistic one with the possibility of formal, one with the formal definition in logic, like ESA or, or, or you know, uh, te uh, taxonomy, to uh, something which is semi-formal relationship po uh, represent possible like patronomy. There are multiple part of for, for patronomy, type of part of patronomy, and some can be formally represented, others can't, and then all this kind of stuff. And here, you know, social scientists will argue, indeed this is an example of that, an expression of that, and so on and so forth, right? And then comes, after all these things after that, comes relationship with the human. Very complex, right? So what happens here, when you are trying to do build robots, and humanoids rather, right? Yeah, there's a lot of discussion these days on things like humanoids, right? What's happening? They will have to try and get into this kind of stuff. I talked about all this, and I still I didn't talk about such things as emotion. We we'll have to come here, right? The, the the closeness you feel. What does it mean? How do you express formally what we mean by closeness? How do you say I'm closer to you than I'm closer to you? How do you do that? And what? How much more closer than that? Very hard things, right? So why is this problem hard, right? So our objects, um, you know, one simplistic thing, I, and some, one thing that I recognized very, very long time ago is that you take any two objects or, you know, uh, entities, and if you are to if they are exactly the same, exactly the same, you can say they are exactly the same. The moment they say, you say they are not exactly the same, then you say how similar, mm -hmm. how different. Mm -hmm. And that is a very complicated question. Mm -hmm. right? 
So Sara C was talking about semantic similarity. That's why I called her in a way and come, you know, listen to the nuance of similarity, right? And differences. In fact, for the word semantic similarity itself, there are many variants. Mm -hmm. Semantic similarity, semantic distance, semantic distinction, semantic proximity, uh, semantic relatedness, semantic relevance, right? So we use all this linguistic thing to try and convey, but you tell computer program to compute and come to the same conclusion, that would be too hard, right? So what happens is that, so implicit versus explicit, anytime the implicit, this implicit is harder, right? So formal and assertion is easier somewhat, at least you have mechanisms, you see languages to do that. For, you know, you could use, let's say, for sort of logic language, you can use description, or further, you know, subset of first logic called description logic, you can use that, versus social consensus based. Powerful, which I define in the paper as beyond F1. Right? Partial. Contextual. That they are related, but only in this context. So in my, um, uh, you know, in my group I say that, um, uh, you know, you're married, uh, you know, that's outside of the lab. In lab you are still students and, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, there's no special thing. Right? So it's contextual, right? In the word, I don't care, I don't, you know, I don't recognize that much. I, I, I look at each of you as individual. In non-work context, yes, you are, you know, whatever. So, so you can see, um, uh, you know, it, it can be probabilistic, can be fuzzy. Again, these are all, like, you know, uh, uh, languages that are there, representations. This thing, degree of relatedness and relevance. So that's why I, I use this, right, the term semantic, similarity, proximity, distance, Differentiation, disjointness, relating context, okay. Even easily involves different notions, which are identify, unity, essence. And you can, you have to look up uh, this uh, thing. Just is, uh, you know, identity, is, uh, sorry, easily itself has multiple things, right? Um, then uh, these are these terms, semantic ambiguity, also based on incomplete, inconsistent, and approximate information knowledge. The world is inherently, you know, uh, not really black and white. It's gray, shades of gray. Much of what we have in life is shades of gray, right? And these are very interesting and distinct, uh, uh, you know, concepts, which is what makes representation of relationship harder, recognition and representation harder. It is the information will be incomplete. That makes it hard. The information will be inconsistent that sometimes you observe this and sometimes you don't observe this. You look at two humans, uh, they are warm toes at some time and other time they are not. So, you know, they are not, in, they are not consistent, for example. So it's hard to say what, you have to name it. And they are, uh, the information that you have captured about anything can be approximate. You don't have exact information, right? So, uh, somebody will say, oh, it was hot today. Well, but you don't know. Uh, for uh, what is hot for you may not be hot for me, right? So uh, we have developed um, on this thing. I'm not going to talk much about uh, um, facilitated search and semantic analysis. Was some early work which uh, uh, made me uh, think about relationship. Um, uh, and um, facets means uh, properties, attributes, same thing. Um, this was a very interesting thing in um, MREF, where by on HREF, right? You all know HREF. Uh, on that, we say we will associate metadata. So it's a complex representative relationship. When you say href, href, there's a relationship between that string, word, or, you know, that is connected to that document. Okay? The interesting thing is, when I say this string, you can find more information on this here. I take that, that's my text, and then I link it to this document. What? What exactly are you saying? So the idea was that metadata reference link would explicitly capture what aspect of the target is being talked about when you insert that link, more than that blob of text or object that is out there. 
that may be a video, that may be, in that case, I would say interpretation of the video that is relevant to me. Video may talk about many, many things. I even talk about only one specific aspect of it. Right? So, it's, uh, it's, uh, so for example, this metadata is going to be a domain specific data, right? Because we are talking about this kind of, this entity or this uh, link or document that we are referring to in this context. It may so it's going to be different. It may be, it, it's just matter, it just might, depends, right? Sometimes I'm talking about something very specific. For example, I would say uh, href to a mathematical equation, and that equation is unambiguous interpretation, so no, it is not domain specific. Or I'm talking about something that is very subjective, right? Uh, and then, uh, so he is a, uh, uh, you know, he is very religious. Well, what do you mean, very religious? Does he, you know, go to church every Sunday? Is that, is that what it is? Or something else? Well, that's not clarified. But the document says something. Right? And so, you can pull it out and then say, that's what I mean. I have opportunity to do that. HR does not give me that opportunity. It simply gives me a link. And there, there's, there can be a lot of things on the link. So, uh, now the next, first one of the topic we need to think about is how do you extract this? If there is a bunch of data out there, how do you extract those relationships? Right? So, it can be to convert the content with structure for web pages, deep web, they have a structure and you can look at the structure from well formed text. Edit it for rules of grammar from uh, informal or casual text on social networking sites, from digital media. These are various sources from which I can possibly extract relationship. And there are many, many ways to do that. Uh, knowledge engineering approaches. Uh, for example, there may be manually crafted rules or lexical items like say, uh, uh, somebody, something uh, works uh, which is a person works for organization. So that's my pattern. And I'm looking for installation of that pattern and then I, you know, uh, uh, positing that uh, indeed it's a person that works for organization. In, this may not be quite accurate. It may be an organization that works for organization also. So I'm making a rule and I match this and I said I found it is, you know, an instance of person works for organization, but in reality it may be organization. Okay, so, so that the, so this is not all that um, it, it is challenging not you know to do it accurately. You you can exploit uh, syntactic structure. So you parse text and look at the text structure, and from that you are look for verbs, adjectives, other things, linguistic construct, and from there you uh, talk about. So gauge, for example, is a well-known um, uh, set of uh, well-known tool for uh, language understanding, for text processing, for switching rules, for parsing, many other things that you can do. There's a bunch of cool things available in Gage. Uh, but basically it is linguistic and um, you know, language based uh, uh, you know, approach, okay. Versus machine learning approaches, classification. We talked about classification earlier, supervised, semi-supervised, and supervised kind of classification techniques. So, uh, you know, then I give you some example of supervised uh, classification uh, and a variety of examples are there. I won't go into those details. Again, so there are, uh, say, molecular pathway, for example, or protein interactions. These are some example publications, but they are hard for it domain specific rules that encode patterns used to extract those type of relationships. So, you know, when you start to understand what's happening here, you have to say typically, see, specificity of relationship type. More specific it is, more likely that you can come up with a good approach to uh, extract that, specify, you know, the rules for those things. And also, uh, types of entities involved in the relationship, because there are very specific types of entities involved. Right? And so you can narrow and, you know, uh, 
the vocabulary and, and reduce the ambiguity. There are many other nuances that you uh, have to you, you, you need to worry about. Um, here, for example, I'm extracting relationship from that text. I'm trying to create, uh, you know, this table of disease outbreak relations, and, and then you know, you say the date, disease name, and location. That's what I'm trying to extract from the text. So this is an example of relationship extraction. Here is some another um, example, and you can see a different kind of relationship involved. And uh, oh, okay, this is you know this implicit and explicit relationships. So here in this case, uh, semantic role labeling is being applied. Operates. Kind of stuff. So uh, you can, you know, use the language structures here to essentially identify uh, relationships. Here, uh, this is another so-called semantic role labeling, and you can see the different roles here and the examples that are given. So. Um, Subject ring object, right? So, yes, uh, it needs to uh, identify relationship. Now, um, the, the challenge is to, uh, yeah, I don't press on, won't go to discussion with them, but that's true, they have quite a different relationship. Question is, is there a pre existing vocabulary relationship you're interested in? Or is it totally free form? And if so, how how does the system um, uh, distinguish between A works for B, A is employed by B? Right? So I come across this thing. In the real world, does is the intention is this the same or is it different? How do you recognize if indeed they are same? How do you recognize? Employed by and works for being synonymous. Are they exactly the same, either, or there is some nuance between the two? For example, um, one of the things, uh, workflow or employed by, but for, so for example, the work employed by has a more specific legal meaning, and works for may not have specific legal meaning. Employed by, employment. Uh, and there are legal definitions of what an employment means. Uh, for example, the things happening with Google, um, um, uh, with the, the uh, taxi service, um, um, Uber, 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 you know, with the, whether those uh, drivers are employees or not, right? So, so even, even I think the language is different here. Like, for example, when you say works for, you're making the person as an, an important entity here. But when you say employed by, then the importance comes to the organization. Possibly. Awesome. Is, is that intentional or is it just because a person is not so, um, uh, you know, we saw in the morning uh, that a lot of people don't have, you know, sophisticated language skills. Okay. So there are many, many other techniques here that I mentioned, I will go into that. For well, some of it is very interesting. There is a rule and heuristic based measure method. So there is a very well known project called Yago. That can be done that. Then I have some examples of these things, like different easy parser and all that. Um, you know, and then here's an example of a very complex relationship identifier. So if you think about it, if you look at this sentence, um, the uh, relationship may be simple, but here 
it is um, uh, it does not it's not about estrogen induces hyperplasia or or uh, you know or estrogen induces endometrium anything like that it is really the entire thing an excessive endogenous or exogenous stimulation is the compound entity and only for that uh, in fact by estrogen only for that the indu uh, relationship induces meaningful induces is not meaningful for just estrogen or any other component thereof that entire thing is important right so you know this relationship exists only for the entire, you know, this subject and this object as a whole. That makes it for a very challenging kind of stuff. There's a lot more. This was work by one of my former PhD students. This is Karthik Ramakrishna's work. So I won't go into details of stuff that he did, but it gives you an idea. Here is a very interesting thing here. Okay, this shows how he was, how he actually built the system. Then this slide you have seen before, where the idea here is that you uh, take whatever type of uh, document, right, an extractor, and then create um, metadata, so here this thing you have seen before. Mm -hmm. um, the interesting thing is that um, simplistic techniques do limited tagging, mm -hmm. mostly syntactic, but um, then you can, uh, you know, you want to do uh, more uh, enhanced tagging, mm -hmm. and you give a lot more context of what uh, the uh, thing is about. So um, uh, you could, uh, you know, add additional metadata uh, to make whatever that relationship is actually more meaningful. Because, um, of course, you need to understand and make some assumptions about what it is to make it more explicit. So the idea here is that um, in the text you were able to find some entities and relationships, but uh, you know that this text was written in a very specific context, and hence you can go to the additional knowledge base or database and pick up those things and explicitly represent here, so everything is represented with the data as a metadata. Otherwise, it will be implicit here, which you explicate by adding additional metadata. So this is called semantic enhancement. In the, in the paper on semantic enhancement engine, this is the semantic enhancement part of it. Here again, there's some more going on. Uh, I've sh I think I've shown you this thing before. Here is an example uh, whereby um, the very interesting example compared to what all the things but you have seen well, the text and all that. Now in this case, this file is only made up of number. But now you are saying that this is M over Z, uh, ma mass or something, you know, I know something like that, charge. And so uh, that you know what that means. Uh, and. Um, this is uh, adding a bunch of mirror data and tags and hence relationship to mass spectroscopy data. Then something I uh, something about video data and how you uh, do relationship. This is what this is interesting in the sense that uh, here you have a document, but you have uh, different types of relationship. The relationship coming from domain ontology like person and company, mm -hmm. right? Like box for a third person, spatial ontology coordinate system or location and temporal. Right? So you have different components of the relationships. So this is some early work. Oh, this is HRF. Uh, and HRF was, uh, this is 1998 and 1996 slides where we actually defined uh, MRF in RDF. Um, so here, is the thing, some text is some interesting information on that is available here. And there's a link from information on that, uh, you know, dam. And essentially that 
if you click on that, all you get is this. So what if you were able to actually give various other things? Right? So this was the idea of MREF. Lot more metadata than information dynamic link, right? Here is another example. So potential location for a future shopping mall identified by all regions having a population greater than 500 in area greater than 50 square meter having an urban land cover and moderate relief. And then here is a specification of MREF which basically uh, codifies that text in a executable query which goes against database when you click on that it is a query against database and hence you get the results dynamically. HRF will take you to the link. It could take you also to uh, you know, query against database. Here, there is a specific way of create, you know, here is a more um, structured query, you know, way of uh, specifying query that can codifies what is in the text. Okay, so this is syntax, that's structure. So will the demo, uh, will it pop up and show a small box or like will it? No, it will execute that query and then show you the result from a table. Or not result, it will tell, show you, I'll, let me show you exactly how it looks like. In this implementation, okay? So, and then that, that query I showed you would involve query against the census database, query, uh, query against tiger line uh, database, and map database, image features. Because it had all those different components if you look at it. Land cover, and really, relief is a, um, the query against image database, not textual database. So very different, this is the result. That is the, this is map, and that particular uh, location, uh, the, this particular you know, area has satisfies those uh, conditions that are in the So the result is not tabular right now, so it's actually uh, an image uh, with overlay. There's things on. Um, uh, so this was a very other other example of relationship, right? Uh, um, it can be probabilistic uh, uh, relationship. So uh, there is a theory. There was a theory that um, um, when nuclear tests are conducted, then under certain circumstances they cause earthquake. And uh, they cause earthquake in certain, you know, of course not too far off, but somewhere nearby, and not ten years from now. It is some time now, right? So then, through analysis of data, you find correlation between uh, nuclear tests and earthquakes, mm -hmm. and the correlation looks like this. So this is your relationship, mm -hmm. and it basically says that. Typically, there is no correlation. Uh, there is no relationship between earthquake uh, and uh, if the uh, and, and nuclear test if the earthquakes are larger than seven um, on the Richter scale. So, large earthquakes are not, you know, caused by uh, uh, by nuclear test. And uh, only smaller, you know, uh, earthquakes in certain time frame, uh, in uh, you know, they, they cause it or something like smoking causes cancer. That, is that simple? No, it's it's pretty complicated. It may actually, the result may be expressed only as something like this. So the relationship is again very complicated. Now this is not uh, something that I express in few words. It is actually a graph. So the point is how do you express this itself can be very interesting. Here, volcano eruption affects environment. In that case here, volcano, uh, you know, results in ash rain that destroys building, uh, ash rain that cools temperature and affects weather, uh, has a pyroclastic flow that destroys plants and kills people and so on and so forth. You see, so the relationship is here is a very complex relationship. This kind of shows how limited uh, what we are doing in terms of you know similarity and relationship and those kind of stuff. Okay. 
But just the same way, the point I wanted to make uh, is that just the same way, Kartik was able to find that need, clear need for the com compound entities, and and then worked on doing something, and that's what made it unique. As opposed to doing simple things, right? Like number test and something you can find, so what? So you have to understand what is really meaningful, and then try and find solve that problem, even if you can solve it immediately. So I would I would rather um, solve. I would rather give a limited solution to a real world complex problem than to give a complete solution to a trivial problem. That is no real world implication. So, so the idea here is that you have all this kind of literature and documents, and you have this hypothesis. Now, come up with the relationship. May cause in exactly what? Is it really true? True. And when you try to do that, you'll find a complex relationship. So that that is something like this: a nuclear test could have caused an earthquake if the earthquake occurred sometime after the nuclear test was conducted and in the nearby region. And then, what do you mean by sometime? What do you mean by near? Uh, you know, thing. So now do data fitting. So you start looking at something more specific and see which one is best validated. So you then divide the problem of different ranges of uh, you know thing and, uh, uh, and you start thing and then you find some relationship like that. Okay, I'm not going to go through these things. How that was done, but another very interesting thing was how are Harry Potter and Dan Brown related? And uh, you know what Kartik did was to look at um, you know Harry Potter and uh, I think there was this uh, book Dan Brown's book where there's Da Vinci Code and uh, there's a mention of Victor Hugo in that and there is this um, uh, you know a uh, uh, sort of group uh, an initial uh, you know group of people uh, some list of people that were involved through this guy named Nicholas Fossin so. Uh, you know, they were able to find uh, this picture did not build well, but if uh, basically it showed um, building of uh, making all these connections. So there are these four pictures, three pictures, four pictures, right? And uh, they are all appear on different Wikipedia pages, and you can see all the entities on that Wikipedia page, all the you know key entries on these pages, all key entries on these pages, these pages, and then you see all the links when you you know one thing referred to other uh, from the Wikipedia pages to other so you got all those links and then you uh, created um, you know relationship between these and so this is an uh, example of undiscovered public knowledge the pieces were there in different places then you took this as um, uh, a good example that everybody can understand but to solve the problem in biology so that we have this Placing semantic trails, trails which is going through relationships in biomedical literature. Now, this was one of the most influential paper of all time by Venable Bush, titled "As We May Think," in the Atlantic uh, Monthly in 1945. So, uh, you know, let, let me read this: uh, The physician puzzles by her patient's reaction strikes a trail established in studying an earlier similar case and runs rapidly through analogous case histories with side references to the classics of um, uh, pertinent anatomy and histology. The chemist struggling with the synthesis of an organic compound has all the chemical literature before him in his laboratory with trace following the analogies of compound and side trails to the physical and chemical behavior. So he, 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 he talks about uh, trailblazing and where you, you basically are going from one concept to another concept in context for a particular purpose. And he claims that you, this is how human brain thinks, as we may think. Okay? And the earth, the relationship play, play extremely critical role. Right? Because 
is you know that you're going from concept to another concept in context over certain relationship creating a tree. So here the original documents with highlighted terms, and when you are able to get those highlighted terms, you are able to find this knowledge. If you do the gene, which is usually uh, which well known for its implications of cancers, and that regulates DNA damage that causes uh, something that is with cancer. But, um, but sometimes, you know, there are lots of trends that you can see in the data, but they are not really meaningful. Right, so right, right. how do you actually filter those? I mean, how to get the, the most beneficial relationships and meanings from these relationships? Uh, yes, uh, there are too many possible uh, relationships, especially if you are looking for implicit relationships, there will be too many. Right? And that's why there's a law of literature that says correlation um, is not causation. Right? That's a very well known idea, right? So how do we do it is actually uh, what the whole innovation competing comes to. This is precisely the topic that um, Delroy had to address. So what Delroy does is to, he, he does this thing of taking all the documents, uh, analyzes them, find the relationship, and then creates a graph. Of which is compressed the graph is multiple entries, multiple relationship, and that collectively represents an object, not just with one entity in one relation, with simple, but one entity with another in a simple relationship. So, oops, I didn't know I would, I would have that, but anyway, that's what it is. So, and then uh, let's see, I think there's uh, anything very critical, and there are some algorithms for this. Okay, and this is an interesting thing. You know, says here everything is connected all along the line, cause and effect. That's the beauty of it. Our job is to trace the connection and reveal them. Jack and Terry, you know, and so you know, in this film, it's very well known. And that kind of, you know, what is meaningful that you connect, right? So here, you find, you know, this is software uh, where you have this person, and you have all this list, and you make just an interesting connection. It's like saying. Um, you know, trying to find today you know, all these people who do all these things, and but then who, will, what is the likelihood that somebody actually is going to go and join ISIS? So that's an example of um, thing you try to um, find. And these are not complex. There's no simple answer to all any of those things. Anyway, the events and temporal and spatial and um, um, stuff. Uh, this this knows now sensor data. You know, similarly sensor web thing. Um, and again, shows you the things in that area. I'm not going to go into these things. But I think I basically captured you the essence of, uh, you know, uh, the in, this is the end thing. So the web, social software, semantic web, and the uh, connect, you know, something that goes to intelligent and this relationship web. And it just kind of tries to keep picture where degree of information connectivity and degree of social connectivity is just one way people have uh, tried to. Uh, put all these things together. And then there's this formal, implicit, social, or informal, and then you go to powerful, which kind of, in that, you know, paper talks about that stuff. So. All right, so that is basically um, this uh, topic. Uh, there's a lot more, obviously, I just, uh, and if you're interested, obviously, you can um, uh, pick up this, uh, Presentation and the references at the bottom of every of the things, right? And those papers that I showed you. Any questions at this point? No? Amit? Mm -hmm. Yes? All right, thank you. So, um, all come ready, right? With the uh,